jaws obsession welcome back welcome back thank you for listening and for coming back in this year of 2023 as we approach the 50th anniversary of jaws in 2025 but who knows you could be out there 50 years from now you might be the listener 50 years from now anxiously awaiting the 100th anniversary of jaws in the year 2073 and maybe you stumbled upon this 67th episode of the jaws obsession where once again we are here to share with you prove to you convince you or remind you that jaws is the greatest movie of all time and it's great to have you here no matter what year you are listening in and that's something that what we're realizing here uh, as we come together for with the jaws obsession what we're embarking on here is not just a journey into an expanded jaws universe it's also, uh, before I've used the term information trading posts, we're going forward. This is going to be used for research purposes, possibly, if someone wants to learn more about the movie Jaws and wants to uh, indulge themselves into the furthest reaches of the Jaws universe, they could come here because this podcast isn't going anywhere. It's always going to be floating out there. Uh, we, uh, our time on this earth is not forever, but what we do here and what we actually, um, but what we actually leave behind in the digital age will be around forever. And that, that, that these podcast platforms, I believe, are just going to be out there floating around. Um, uh, maybe they'll be accessed in different ways in 50 years from now, but they will still be out there. And this is a great little thing to have. Uh, the, the, best, the greatest movie of all time should have something like this where uh, listeners from all over the world can get together to look further into this movie that has brought us all together, that has brought you here right now listening to my voice. I think it's fantastic to see how this has evolved and how uh, even myself, I do not understand sometimes why I'm going into a certain topic, but when I do and you open that door up, um, it unlocks different mysteries, different clues, and it adds more questions. It actually makes the events in Jaws more intriguing. And that's what this episode 67, The Lady of the Dunes, we are going to talk about her legend. We are going to talk about what she means to the Jaws universe. And if you, you might be very familiar with the story of The Lady of the Dunes, you might have heard it for the first time just now. But when you're done with this episode, you are going to realize that Jaws is a snapshot in time. And there are many stories to be told within those frames, within those film frames that were taken and assembled into what we know as the movie Jaws. Who was the Lady of the Dunes? And is she seen for two seconds in the movie Jaws? Uh, we're going to be linking a real-life murder mystery here with the forever aspects of film. 
I think that is just so intriguing here. So I'm excited to get into this episode and to see where this goes. This is not a new discovery, by, uh, but I felt uh, because we but because there has been talk of the Lady of the Dunes on other podcasts, on other YouTube channels. It was at one time the state of Mass- Massachusetts' longest running cold case. And new discoveries just brought it into the media uh, once again. So I felt that it was a good time after the Chrissy victimology episode, which was episode 66, that this was a perfect time to introduce the Lady of the Dunes into the Jaws obsession and see where she might lead us as we view the movie going forward. A lot of different planes we're operating on here, and we'll see where we can see where this takes us. Just a bit of a warning that there's going to be graphic details discussed ahead in this episode. It's nothing out of the stretch of a true crime broadcast or unsolved mysteries type show, uh, but Jaws fans with the we're 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 fully prepped with a PG ratings of torsos and legs dropping out of boats, so we should be okay with that. But maybe for some younger listeners, we might get into some some graphic details because this is going to be uh, on that true crime broadcast spectrum here. So we're going to be talking about a murder scene and all that. Before we get into that, it was a, a great to have the feedback from the Chrissy Watkins episode, which was uh, which episode 66, Chrissy Victimology. It seems that, they, that everyone out there was sensing the same thing that I have done when I started the uh, writing of the Book of Quint and the research phase into Jaws and then the Jaws Obsession broadcast where we've been diving into s- specific avenues and sequential narratives that are in the movie that your imagination starts taking off. Characters come to life more. It was exciting to see. So that episode 66 was how we can actually uh, give more background to Chrissy Watkins. It was felt through the emails as well. I had Kimberly write in from England And she said, I've just finished listening to the latest episode of the podcast. Just brilliant. I never cease to be amazed at how much you draw out of seemingly tiny and inconsequential details to paint a fuller picture within the Jaws universe. One thought I had about Chrissy's last words were that they sounded a bit like the words from the Bible. Maybe the Psalm, uh, e.g. Psalm 38, verse 21 to 22 says... Lord, do not forsake me. In other words, do not abandon me. Do not be far from me. My God, come quickly to me, my Lord and my Savior. That was the quote from the Bible that Kimberly found. And she goes on to say, I know that's not an exact match, but the sentiment is similar. She could be praying in her last moments. I'm sure many people pray when they're terrified, but if she is praying using language she has learned from the Bible, this might add an extra dimension to her background. Has she been away from the church during the past few years and is now running back to her faith, or is the church is what she is running from? Listening to the podcast, I had a feeling that perhaps she has been in an abusive relationship that she has escaped from. One day the opportunity presents itself and she just runs, gets as far as Amity, and doesn't really have any plan for what's next. She just wants to swim in the ocean because she has been able to do that for a long time. I don't know, maybe my imagination is running away with me. Anyway, lots to think about as always. Best wishes to you and your family, Kimberly. Thank you so much for the email, Kimberly. And that is exactly, this is really interesting. Let's not wait till you hear this, Kim. Uh, A half a world away... I had Josh write into the show via the Book of Quint Instagram page over at Instagram.com at Book of Quint. Josh writes in, uh, Hi, Ryan. When Chrissy is holding on to the buoy and says the line about your uh, about abandoning me, etc., I think she's talking directly to God, which would tell me she left the sisterhood. I bet she, I'd bet she was a nun that left the order and makes her the perfect sacrifice for the first shark as she was about to commit sin and probably for the first time. Keep up the brilliant work, bud. Regards, Josh in Sydney, Australia. So do you see what's happening here is that our imaginations open up and uh, when, we, when we look into these details, as a Jaws fan base, we, we kind of sync up in many ways because Kimberly and Josh... England and Australia can also come to similar conclusions there that there was a little bit more going on to the story of Chrissy Watkins than we might have previously known if we don't take the time and go into some of these details in the movie Jaws. And this is where the research phase that I am in right now currently is leading me to 
a much bigger picture in expanding the Jaws universe. I can't announce anything officially just yet, but that is the plane that we are on right now. And we are all in sync. And uh, the email responses from Kimberly and Josh and some of the comments from others prove that there's a desire to know more, that the Jaws universe is much greater than we might have previously imagined. It's great to see. Thank you very much for writing in. I love it when uh, listener imaginations start running and you start thinking of background information because what's happening is, is that when you start doing that, your suspension of disbelief increases. So therefore the movie Jaws, the enjoyment of the movie Jaws exponentially increases as well. And that's where I feel that we have we have been in error a little bit in recent years as the lore of the making of Jaws has been known more and more. That maybe we tend to see the the flaws or the filming problems as we watch the movie instead of actually watching the movie. And if you and, and that's the so that's the direction I've tried to take the Jaws obsession in that we are we tend to talk about that Jaws universe. We step inside the Jaws universe to see where we can go in that direction. For other shows, they might go towards the making of and talk about that. So that's that's one of the great things we're doing here is we're expanding our scope. Episode 66, Chrissy Victimology, definitely turned that volume up on that aspect of the Jaws obsession. So I am excited to get into this one, episode 67, The Lady of the Dunes. This is going to be mostly, we're going to talk about the making of Jaws. The Lady of the Dunes is actually a real life uh, murder mystery that happened during the making of Jaws. And we're going to step outside of the Jaws universe. But in the end of this episode, I'm going to jump back into the Jaws universe and see where the Lady of the Dunes can help us expand that even more. For this episode, I literally did boots on the ground investigation myself. I spent some time in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I was able to get some on the ground intel into um, to just to for research purposes, I am gathering as many facts and uh, visual inputs as I can for writing in the future. One of the things that I focused on when writing the Book of Quint was diving into the memories I had as a sailor myself when I spent uh, it, from time in the Coast Guard on search and rescue at a search and rescue station um, on the motor lifeboats, or when I was on the icebreaker, and and or when I was a or, or a deep sea diver. You have to extract some of the details of your experiences, and that makes your writing more vivid. Um, not to make this into a writing podcast, but uh, going forward, in order to expand on the Jaws universe, I want to collect as much visual data as possible. And this led me into looking in great detail into the Lady of the Dunes legend. So I am back now, and I have many stories to share. Um, I don't know if I'll get to them all on this broadcast, However, I came back more intrigued that there's a direction that is sort of pushing the story out. There's a direction where it's forming. Events that happen in real time as, as we do these shows, as I broadcast each episode and I do the research phase for each episode, so goes the research phase for future writings. It's very interesting to see what develops and it's exciting at the same time. So we are, we're, definitely, we're definitely on uh, the cutting edge here the cutting edge. It's exciting to ride this wave and who knows where it's going to take us. So when we talk about the Lady of the Dunes, we have to start with the date, the infamous date, July 26, 1974. This is a story of a uh, of the remains of a woman found on a beach, a police chief that never gave up, a faithful church parish cemetery that would uh, create a legend that lasted 48 years. It inspired a new generation of investigators, reporters, authors, and filmmakers to reach a conclusion. It, it, it kind of pushed a conclusion right out, and that was at the end of last year, and it's still ongoing. I'm going to read articles that are just hours old. In the background of all of this, during this cold case, and as the evidence came to light, that the movie Jaws was sitting there right in the background the whole time. What remains of the lady in the story I am about to tell is just that, a story. She has no voice, no authority, not even a name of her own. For all we know, her lover may have been her demise and the reason why her lifeless remains were found in the dunes off the coast of Provincetown, Massachusetts. 
Along with her name, her identity was wiped away. Both hands were torn from her arms, her teeth ripped from her mouth, her clothes torn away. She was found weeks after her death, face down in the dune, lost to the world that once knew her. And that was one of the excerpts from the Lady of the Dunes, a true crime documentary from filmmakers Frank Durant and uh, one of the and the writer of the book Lady of the Dunes by Christopher Sutherland. And I'm going to link to this documentary in not only the show notes, but also in the description of this broadcast below. The Lady of the Dunes was the name given to the uh, unknown woman that was found on July 26, 1974, when a 12-year-old girl following a barking dog to the decomposing body of an unidentified woman in the Race Point Dunes of Provincetown, Massachusetts. I feel it's best to start right off with one of the earliest articles I could find was from the Boston Globe, December 22nd, 1974, an article by John B. Wood of the Globe staff titled The Baffling Case of the Body on Cape Dunes. I'm going to read through some of this article, and let's see if we can find some details here. It says, uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Provincetown is, is uh, for, for anyone that doesn't know, Provincetown is located at the very end of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. It's about 100 miles from Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard being an island south of Cape Cod, and Provincetown is located at the end of Cape Cod, not too far away from Boston. This would have been uh, five months after the discovery of the body. On a hot afternoon last July, a 13-year-old Provincetown girl wandered away from a friend's cottage in the Cape Cod National Seashore looking for her dog. She walked about 100 yards into the dunes where she heard the dog, a beagle, barking. 50 yards further on, in a clump of scrub pine, she saw him sniffing at what looked like a naked woman sunbathing. But the woman wasn't sunbathing. She was dead. The little girl looked again to be sure her eyes weren't deceiving her. Then she turned and ran. Four hours later, police removed the badly decomposed body of a woman, about 30, with a fist-sized hole in her left temple. Both hands had been hacked off at the wrist. Such was the discovery of one of the most bizarre murder mysteries to hit Cape Cod in recent memory, a mystery that is not much closer to solution now than it was five months ago. To this day, no one has been able to identify the woman found on the beach that day in July. Despite the intense investigation, police can only guess who murdered her and why they have no weapon, no motive, and few clues. After six months, the body in the dunes remains a puzzle. Since July 26, as many as 30 police detectives have combed the dunes for province, of Provincetown to no avail. And while some new clue may yet identify the woman, police admit that for the moment they are stumped. Quote, we're still working on it, Provincetown Police Chief James Meads said last week. We're hoping that if we can find out who she is, then maybe that will lead to whoever killed her. But it's hard work and we haven't got much to go on. We're going to get to Police Chief James Meads in a little bit. Let me just read a couple more details here from this article. In a slight depression in the sand, the woman lay face down on a green beach towel, naked except for a blood-soaked bandana. Her arms severed at the wrist uh, were at her sides. Her, her reddish-brown hair pulled back in a ponytail and bound with a gold-flecked elastic lay matted around her shoulders. Her dungarees were neatly folded beneath her head and part of the towel had been folded back to cover her face. A medical examiner later determined that she had been dead for at least a week. No sign of struggle. There was no sight of struggle and the sand hadn't been disturbed. The next day, police and uh, from several surrounding towns searched the dunes for some clues to the woman's identity. They found none. The medical examiner and pathologist inspected the body for identifying marks, in internal injuries, or traces of foreign substances. There were none. A Park Service bloodhound and his handler prowled the dunes for two days. They found nothing. They examined the woman's clothes for fingerprints, laundry marks, or identifying labels. There were none. Several earlier clues proved fruitless. Two sets of footprints were found leading toward the body, but they disappeared in the sand a few yards away. Only 50 feet from the body, a set of tire tracks led towards the dune, toward the dunes. They could have been connected or they could not have been connected. Uh, how do you know, said Meads. I want to talk a little bit about Provincetown Police Chief James Meads. 
So the unidentified body would go on to be known as the Lady of the Dunes. The police chief were uh, the the police were stumped. They were never able to prove her identity. I want to skip ahead. Uh, I, I'm going to skip ahead a few years to an article that appeared in the Boston Globe in 1987, September 6. 13 years later, still no identity. And what what happened was this police chief, um, police chief James Meads. He actually took this he took this case very personally. He felt extremely strong about trying to solve this case, find the identity of the victim and catch her killer who would be still out there. Uh, so much that he was able to preserve the body from my research from what I'm seeing and I just got back from uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts where I was able to talk to a nice lady named Jackie over and she belonged to the parish at St. Peter's and uh, that they that she filled me in on some details about how that parish was they a, they gave her a burial in their cemetery where most towns around that time for an unsolved case if there was if there was no place if there were no nobody stepping forward to claim the body eventually it would be cremated but they actually stepped up and gave her a proper burial at the request of the police chief, James Meads, at that time. Now, this is one of those moves that proved, in, that, that proved so important, this step, that move right there, preserving the body in a burial site, is what helped solve the case only recently. Uh, there is a photo that we're going to have over at our show notes. The uh, You'll see the famous photo of Police Chief James Meads, and he's holding up a forensic artist drawing of the Lady of the Dunes as she was known at that time because she had no identity. And he had her uh, her skull that was reconstructed in a forensic way with the dental records, the loose teeth that were found at the scene, and they reconstructed all that. So Meads was 41 years old and had been Provincetown's chief of police just four years when the body of the Lady of the Dunes was disc- was found in the dense grove of scrub pine trees about two and a half miles east of Race Point on that July 26, 1974. The woman, estimated to be 25 to 30 years old, about 5 feet 8 inches tall, uh, with an athletic build, had been killed by a blow to the left side of her skull. She was found nude, lying sideways on a light green terry cloth beach blanket. Her dungarees and blue print bandana, dungarees and blue bandana, were found neatly under her head as they used the, uh, as though used as a pillow. Her blouse has never been found. Her long reddish brown hair was held back. On her teeth were seven gold crowns worth about five to eight thousand at the time. Although pathologists said she had been dead only four or five days, the July heat and dune flies had left the body badly decomposed. Although there was no sign of a struggle and the bed of pine needles on which she lay was undisturbed, Meads believes she knew her assailant and was asleep when attacked. Uh, let's see, Schwartz reconstructed the teeth, jaw, and skull, and Dr. Clyde Snow, a renowned forensic anthropologist for the Civil Air Medical Institute of the Federal Aviation Administration, now retired, created a clay model of the woman's features. Desperate for leads, Meads got articles on the case published in dental journals and police and detective magazines. Thousands of dentists were contacted in an effort to locate the one who has done the expensive dental work. Meads appeared in national magazines and on network television. He traveled extensively following leads. In the intervening years, Meads had received thousands of letters and phone calls. About 50 have been able to supply dental records, but none have matched. On one side of Mead's office, the stack of papers in the case stands two to three feet tall. In another corner, the victim's skull sits in a cardboard, a cardboard box waiting for an identity. A chunk of the skull about the size of a hand is missing, and a jagged 8-inch crack runs across the top. Meads, now 54, is the only law enforcement official who has worked on this case continuously since the body was discovered. Anyone, uh, everyone else has either retired or been reassigned. He is contemplating retiring in three years when he will have 30 years of service. Quote, with most murders, you try to figure out who the murderer was, he said quietly. I've spent years trying to figure out who the victim was. 
Uh, Meads had the body buried in St. Peter's Cemetery in Provincetown. The stone reads, unidentified female. Schwartz said that for years, somebody placed a small vase containing flowers at the marker every July 26. So that was from 1987. And now that goes all the way to, um, in 2011, former police chief James Meads dies at the age of 78. Okay, he was a graduate of Provincetown High School, class of 1951. He was a well-known Provincetown native. He became Provincetown police officer in 1960, and after 10 years on the department, he became police chief, a position he held for 22 years until his retirement in 1992. So he stayed working another five years after this last article was written, and he never was able to find the identity of the Lady of the Dunes And he passed away in 2011. But that move of he had the body buried in St. Peter's Cemetery in Provincetown proved to be one of the the, the most important move of that time. If everyone wants to go and watch this documentary, Lady of the Dunes, a true crime documentary, you get more intrigued. It's that there's there's so many. It's a labyrinth of theories where they bring in psychics. They have all sorts of, they deal with all sorts of uh, leads and they follow all sorts of avenues. At one time, the theory was that she was a victim of Whitey Bulger, the infamous uh, uh, mob boss from Boston who used to frequent the Crown and Anchor in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and that he was known to, him him and his crew were known to dispose of bodies by uh, destroying the dental work as well as removing the hands So there was that theory that this documentary tackles that theory a little bit. But what is the Jaws connection? Because we this here is the Jaws obsession. What is the Jaws connection to the Lady of the Dunes? The cold case murder that dates back to the summer when the movie Jaws was filmed. As Les Trent reports, the victim has been identified, and there may be a connection to the movie. Does the blockbuster movie Jaws hold the key to a murder case that's been cold for almost 50 years? Until now, the victim in the 1974 slaying was known only as the Lady of the Dunes. The Lady of the Dunes was discovered when a teenage girl was walking her dog in the resort beach town of Provincetown, Massachusetts. It was a gruesome discovery. The body was badly decomposed and found lying face down on a beach towel. Her name was not known. But a blue bandana and a pair of jeans found at the scene, folded up under her head, held the key to the mystery. The victim's hands were missing, presumably removed by her killer, so she could not be identified through fingerprints, and her head was nearly severed from her body. Someone had gone to a great effort to make it impossible to identify her. Best-selling horror writer Joe Hill, son of legendary writer Stephen King, has been fascinated by the mystery for years. One theory he has is that the Lady of the Dunes could actually be an extra in the iconic movie Jaws. Is that her in this scene with a bunch of other extras leaving a fairy? Notice, she's wearing a blue bandana and jeans, the same clothes found at the Lady of the Dunes murder site. The woman in that moment um, bore a striking resemblance to the facial reconstruction of the dead woman, of the Lady of the Dunes. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to focus on um, that Stephen King's son, uh, Joe Hill, who is a uh, author, and he is the son of the famous author Stephen King. He back in, and this goes back to 2015, in 2015, he mentioned on his Tumblr page, at the time that he says that he believes that the Lady of the Dunes is seen as one of the crowd in the 4th of July sequence in the movie Jaws. So I'm going to read here from this article, Jaws just got even scarier with this spooky murder mystery connection off the daily dot.com by Aja Romano. Aja goes on to write about take one famously unsolved murder mystery, one of the greatest horror films in history, and one of the best horror writers of the current generation. Add them all together, and we have this summer's most chilling fan theory. It says, obviously, Joe Hill knows a thing or two about horror. 
And he has had, uh, um, also he has an attraction to crime and mystery that runs in his family. Last week on his Tumblr page, so this is going back to uh, August of 2015. So eight years ago, he went on his Tumblr page to explain that he had been reading the unsolved mystery of the Lady of the Dunes, an unidentified woman whose body was found on Cape Cod in July 1974. Though many attempts have been made at reconstructing her appearance based on her remains, her case is still unsolved decades later. The Lady of the Dunes was found the same summer that th- that another horrifying phenomenon came to the Cape. The grandfather of summer blockbuster, Joss. Hill writes about realizing there might be an eerie connection between them. So these are going to be the words of Joe Hill. As he watched Jaws, he says, In June, Jaws was unleashed on theaters once more to celebrate its 40th anniversary. Naturally, predictably, maybe inevitably, I was there. For the first time, I saw the picture that way it was meant to be seen. On the big screen, baby, that shark's mouth is just about wide enough to ride a bicycle into it. I was watching in my usual tranced out state of dreamy pleasure, and then suddenly found myself half lunging out of my seat, prickling with goose flesh. Now understand, I had only just finished reading The Skeleton Crew a few weeks before. The Lady of the Dunes is in many ways the centerpiece of the book. And un- and unlike the other crimes Miss Halber explores, it remains infuriatingly unsolved. After finishing the book, I had spent a few minutes online equating myself with the latest details and studying the recreation of the lady's face. And now suddenly, impossibly, there she was, life-size, looking over her shoulder at me, there for a moment in a busy crowd scene, and then gone. Blue bandana, about 30, fit, 145 pounds. I don't believe those are Wrangler jeans, but a lady presumably, presumably owns more than one pair of jeans. Is this the Lady of the Dunes in Jaws? So let's go into the movie Jaws. This is the scene he's talking about, where we go back and forth from... Uh, Brody and Hooper on the phones marshalling the forces to keep the beaches safe on 4th of July. We see all the tourists coming in on the ferry. Come to Brisbane, and I have a great white shark right here. I'm telling you, we need men to patrol the swimming area. We've got to have help, anybody with a gun or a boat. And right here, right here at 54 minutes into the movie, 54 minutes onto the nose, into the movie, if you look on the left side of the screen, you are going to see a young woman in a white T-shirt, jeans, and a blue bandana. She has shoulder-length uh, brown hair, and she looks back over her shoulder. She looks back over her shoulder, and then the scene, then the take cuts. This is the montage sequence, and that the and, and that what we're seeing is that she's only on the screen for about two seconds. So two seconds, if it's 24 frames a second, we're looking at probably 48 frames, um, 48, 48 pictures of her are in the movie Jaws. And um, I have used one of these frames off the Blu-ray for the title card to this episode. Uh, for episode 67 here. We are going to have all of them in our show notes as well. And if you look uh, that this is this this is what Joe Hill this is who Joe Hill is referring to. 54 minutes and and 50 from 54 minutes to 54 minutes and 2 seconds, the blue bandana, the jeans, the build and the uh, the descriptions that we were given on the left side. Now, granted, remember, now we have to remember that at this time, Jaws was filming. Jaws was filming. Lady of the Dunes was discovered July 26, 1974. And Joe Hill tried to reach out to anybody that knows information about when these shots were gathered. When I was doing the research for the Book of Quint and my multiple trips to Martha's Vineyard, there's two locations on Martha's Vineyard where the ferry comes in and lets people off. One is Vineyard Haven, and the other is Oak Bluffs. And if you look in Jaws, most of what we see there when the ferry is coming into port, that is actually Vineyard Haven. There is a really quick shot of the traffic cop, and he is directing traffic. Yeah. 
That one very quick, that very quick shot of the traffic police officer that blows the whistle, that is filmed at Oak Bluffs, the ferry terminal at Oak Bluffs. So you had a composite. So there was, there was, uh, there, they were getting, they were getting um, pickup shots at these two locations during 1974. Now, was it in June? Was it in early July? These are also times when the second unit went out to go grab these pickup shots. I don't believe that these are all paid extras, that this is just random, almost news camera footage where they just set the camera up and started taking photos of actual tourists coming across on the, on the ferries and, and getting off the, onto the island. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing an unknown woman who, who we don't know. We don't know who this is. She's not on the, as far as I know, she's not on any of the registered uh, lists as a featured extra. As of 2015, this is what we knew. We, we had the Lady of the Dunes unidentified, and then now we have a similar description, similar clothes. The blue bandana is a dead giveaway, and she's right there on the left side of the frame for those two seconds in Jaws. I want to get back now to the documentary, The Lady of the Dunes, a true crime documentary, uh, with uh, Christopher Sederland, produced by Frank Durant. One of the things that this documentary just had a bad luck of timing in that it did not, it, it was uh, that it was trying to follow up all sorts of leads. Their conclusions are drawn using the information that they had at the time. And so what happens is, is that they have the wrong conclusions at the end of the documentary. But one of the very important parts of this documentary is that they, they included, there's a segment that's about an hour and 30 13 minutes into it. It's almost towards the end of the documentary. There's a couple title cards that come up. Now remember, this is after this is after the Lady of the Dunes was already exhumed. Uh, her body was already exhumed three or four times in order to get genetic material, genetic sampling, in order to do DNA testing. But they can only do DNA testing if they have if they had the DNA to try to match it in their system. So, so it, she just, the, she just kept coming up as unidentified, unidentified. It wasn't until this documentary made light of the DNA Doe Project, which is a California nonprofit organization whose mission is to identify John and Jane Doe's using investigative genetic genealogy. And they offered to take the case of the Lady of the Dunes. The, the term genetic genealogy is the term here. This was not available to Chief Meads. All this came about after he passed away. So this uh, genetic genealogy, investigative genetic genealogy, they go on to describe the DNA Doe Project can provide the critical specialized expertise needed in cases like this one. They would also cover the lab fees as well as the costs of exhumation through donations and uh, volunteer genealogists would furnish the genealogical research services pro bono. My name is Dr. Claire Glynn. I'm an associate professor of forensic science at the University of New Haven in Connecticut within the Henry C. Lee College of Criminal Justice and Forensic Sciences. Well, several years ago, I was contacted by a journalist from the Cape Cod Times asking for me to comment on the ability to utilize DNA to identify the Lady of the Dunes case. And so I started to look it up myself and living in New England and loving New England, you tend to gravitate towards cases that are in your own geographical area. Uh, and I just found the case absolutely fascinating and also quite sad that after all of these years, we still haven't been able to identify who this lady was. This is the kicker. So the, the DNA Doe Project reached out to the District Attorney's Office and Massachusetts State Police in 2017, 2019, and in 2021. Law enforcement declined their request each time. This is the ideal case to apply forensic genetic genealogy to um, because it's, it, everything has already been exhausted. All of the DNA profiling, looking through NamUs, the National Missing and Unidentified Persons Database. She's not in there. Her DNA is not in there. They've tried. They've exhumed her three times already trying to identify her. I think at this point they've exhausted everything that we've had available to us up until now, up until the emergence of forensic genetic genealogy. 
And this truly could be the tool that could open, blow this case open um, and finally get an identification of this lady and finally give her a name and finally give her a resting place and return her to her ancestors and her family. So what happened there? Because the, it was included in this documentary, and I believe the people over at the DNA Doe Project um, and this documentary into the Massachusetts, to the district attorney in the state of Massachusetts in 2017, 2019, and 2021, they actually, I believe, they, they broke this wide open because it told the people that are in charge that there is this new type of forensic genealogy, forensic genetic genealogy way of actually trying to find an identity to the Lady of the Dunes. Let's not forget that this was also, the Lady of the Dunes profile was increased by the Joe Hill sighting of the Lady of the Dunes in Jaws. I cannot find anyone mentioning the Lady of the Dunes in Jaws until 2015 when Joe Hill did this. So Joe Hill has a huge role to play here by not only recognizing the uh, clues and bringing and actually reading about the Lady of the Dunes inside the book, The Skeleton Crew, How Amateur Sleuths Are Solving America's Coldest Cases. It's from, uh, it's 2014, uh, uh, written by Deborah Halber. He was reading about the Lady of the Dunes in this book, and then he goes and uses his public profile to attach it to the greatest movie of all time, Jaws. So now here you have the profile of the Lady of the Dunes, then increases. That's how I learned about that the cold case was still going on, was when Joe Hill attached it to Jaws. And we were all like, there, there she is. That's got to be her right there. And then that leads to the documentary. The documentary and the and the and the DNA Doe project then bring the the route of genetic genealogy, forensic genetic genealogy to Massachusetts State Police. And look what happens in October of 2020, 2022. Just one week ago, police finally determined the identity of the lady of the dunes. We can finally say her name. Ruth Marie Terry. Ruth Marie Terry was 37 years old and came from Tennessee. Look at her side by side with the extra from Jaws. Could they be the same woman? I think it's probably the same woman. Police believe the killer might be her husband. I'm sort of fascinated by the idea that for decades afterwards, every time Jaws came on TV, um, he saw his dead wife turning her head to stare out of the screen at him. There's something sort of chilling in that notion. That was the voice of Joe Hill right there um, being interviewed by Inside Edition as as the uh, as the FBI came to light with forensic genetic genealogy, they actually found the identity. They were able to trace the identity of the Lady of the Dunes and give her her name. Her name is Ruth Marie Terry. Ruth Marie Terry, also known as Lady of the Dunes, was formerly unidentified murder victim um, when she was found July 26, 1974, in the Race Point Dunes in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Her body was exhumed in 1980, 2000, 2013, in efforts to identify her. On October 31st, 2022, the FBI field office in Boston announced that Terry had been officially identified. So amazingly that they were able to um, contact the family down in, uh, that, down in Tennessee, that Ruth Marie Terry, who had a birth date of September 8th, 1936, that they are saying that that is, a, that is 100%. The FBI stated that Terry's identity was determined using investigative genealogy the same method used to identify other unidentified homicides and over 150 criminals, including the Golden State Killer. The case is currently being investigated as a homicide by the Massachusetts State Police. So do you see that? Do you see the line of events here is that the, uh, as, as the technology increased, but the awareness of the Lady of the Dunes was kept up by the Jaws theory. As we look at um, I went down to St. Peter's Cemetery and found her grave, and she still has the original marker that says, Unidentified Female Body Found 
Race Point Dunes, July 26, 1974, is still there. I'm going to include pictures of the gravesite as it stands now. Someone has made a rock that has her name, Ruth Marie Terry, and as well as a picture placard that stands there. It says, Lady of the Dunes, Ruth Marie Terry, uh, found and blessed by many angels, September 8th, 1936 to July 26th, 1974. So now there is a face and a name to the Lady of the Dunes in her resting place there. I did talk to Jackie at the parish and they have contacted the family and it is not, um, and the family is making arrangements. Uh, they believe that they're going to keep her there in Provincetown where people have visited her. She, there, there are people that visit her every, every year. They leave stones, flowers, they leave little decorative shells uh, at her gravesite because this story touched so many people in that area up to and including the police officers. Every police chief after Meads, after Chief Meads, uh, really took on this case as a personal weight because the um, it was just there were so many un, loose ends that needed to be tied up and they, they couldn't even find the identity of her, let alone the killer. The famous photo of Chief Meads sitting at his desk with the drawing of her and with her skull, um, the, the her skull sitting there on his desk is just it's just a chilling story that this this man would not give this case up. He did not phone this in, and he went to the his grave knowing that this was going to help if he was able to get her to be buried, not cremated. Do you see that that decision that they made way back then actually allowed for all of this to be happening. As the technology got better and the forensic genetic genealogy from exhuming the body in all these different years afterwards. So that was a very important step that even though he could not, he didn't have the information or the technology to find the killer or to find her identity at times, he was able to have the wherewithal to find her arresting place where then they were able to make her identity known. Now, from if anyone wants to go and see where this goes, if you just now the latest is now it is all about that the DA closes the Lady of the Dunes investigation after determining husband killed her on Cape Cod. Now, this is from August 28th, 2023, and this is uh, literally five hours ago of me recording this episode. Investigators have concluded that the Lady of the Dunes, whose mutilated body was found on a beach in Provincetown, was killed by her husband nearly 50 years ago. Cape and Islands District Attorney announced Monday. Uh, the investigation into uh, in Provincetown on July 26, 1974, prompting an extensive investigation that spanned half a century. The investigation into Terry's death Death was initially investigated by Provincetown Police Chief, but in 1982, the department requested the case be turned over to the Massachusetts State Police Detectives Unit for the Cape and Islands District. The, the article goes on to say that Terry married Guy Muldaven in either 73 or 74, and they traveled after their wedding, stopping in Tennessee to see Terry's family, investigators said. Detectives later learned that Terry and Muldaven traveled during the summer of 74. When Muldaven returned from that trip, he was said to be driving what was believed to be Terry's vehicle and had indicated to witnesses that Terry had passed away. Terry was never seen by her family again, and her brother tried to find his sister with Maldavin, Maldavin only stating that they had a fight during their honeymoon and he had not heard from his wife again. Based on the investigation in the death of Miss Terry, it has been determined that Mr. Maldavin was, was responsible for Miss Terry's death in 1974. Mr. Maldavin passed away in 2002. Maldavin was said to be the prime suspect in the disappearance of one of his wives and a stepdaughter in Seattle, Washington area in the 1960s. And this is the heartbreaking aspect of all of this is that this guy, Maldavin, was uh, wanted. He was actually a person of interest in the, in the disappearance of a former wife and her daughter. Uh, where, it, it, I mean, if you just, if you follow down this, it's just, it's just a heartbreaking rabbit hole of missteps where law enforcement, they couldn't tag this guy. They couldn't lock him down, uh, with the murders of anyone that he was, he was attached to, uh, other murders where the, a, a body was found lying face down. And it's very interesting in this one article I have here, 
1973, she came from Whitwell for one of those visits with her new husband, Guy Maldavin, according to her family. The couple came to Carol and Kenneth Terry's house in Chat. Chattanooga, Tennessee, most likely after they stopped in Whitewell for a family visit. Carol Terry said she was just the same sweet Ruth. She said they didn't stay very long. They were leaving. They said they were going to travel the United States. He was an art dealer. They were going to look for antiques. Kenneth Terry said he recalled the couple saying they were returning to Massachusetts after they left. And now it's been tied uh, that uh, Muldavin's family actually owned properties around Provincetown. His father had properties ever since the 40s and the 50s around Provincetown. So he would have known about these race point dunes. In 1960, Muldavin was suspected in the deaths of his second wife and his daughter and her daughter in Seattle, Washington, uh, according to a 1961 story but they couldn't pin him down, that they found remains on the property, but they couldn't identify those remains, so they could not, uh, they could not convict him of anything, um, that this man was just a walking monster. And what happened was uh, Ruth Marie Terry was married to him, and they were headed back to Massachusetts after 1973. So this would put them, if, the, if this is what's happening here, this would put Ruth Marie Terry in that time in that area when Jaws was being filmed in 1974. This man who now the Massachusetts DA as of today released a statement saying he is the murderer of the Lady of the Dunes, Ruth Marie Terry, Guy Muldaven. Uh, we're going to have this article on our show notes as well if you want to read more into uh, what he did not only before marrying Ruth, but after as well. Heartbreaking story. Um, and it's absolutely that there are monsters out there walking among us. And it's absolutely tragic. So one of the uh, areas that I went over was I was able to walk around the Race Point Dunes um, two weeks ago. And you can actually see as you go around the, uh, you could stay on the hiking trails. And you can see that after you, you walk about a mile into, until it's about a mile until you get to the actual seashore. But these dunes are very expansive and very massive, and it's easy to get lost and just be completely uh, cut off from any kind of communication, especially back in 1974. I mean, not to mention now, at least we have cell phones and we have all the technology of GPS now. But in 1974, it would be very easy to go out there and just never be heard from again. This picture just becomes clear the more that I uh, looked into this. In closing, what I wanted to show was that even now, as the Lady of the Dunes was, uh, a as Ruth Marie Terry was uh, identified as the Lady of the Dunes, her younger photos, they, they do bear a striking resemblance to the mystery woman that's in the blue bandana and jeans in Jaws. Uh, what do you think? Do you think this is the, this is her, um, do you think this is her over on Martha's Vineyard at the time? Was she, uh, was she looking to be in, because Jaws was a very big production and there was all sorts of news about younger people wanting to come in over, trying to be extras, and they were trying out for scenes. Um, was Ruth Marie Terry uh, looking to escape, to uh, make a different life for herself. Uh, from what I understand, she did leave Guy Maldavin a few times. Was she running from him? Uh, what, who is this? Is this the lady? Is she looking? Or what is she looking around for? All these questions uh, still remain around this mystery lady that's on the left side frame at the 54th minute in the movie Jaws. And one of these things that always target that I've that I always target on is I'm a big fan of older movies. I rarely watch newer films or features that are made uh, today. Uh, older movies fascinate me in that that they capture someone in uh, 24 frames a second. So for uh, for these two seconds, we have 48 pictures of this woman. Who was she? And is she the, uh, and is this Ruth Marie Terry? And if it is, that this is something that's immor it's immortalized in that we have a living embodiment, a living representation of this woman 
who ha- who met a tragic end. And that's what films actually do is they lock us in on that time. When I watch older films, I realize that these are real people and sometimes that we we lose track of that that these are real people that lived and breathed and died and that they are that they each have stories to tell of their own and that's fascinating to me especially going forward with the film jaws now if we can go into the jaws universe and we can go into the jaws universe and we can look at this snapshot where this young woman in the blue bandana is uh, looking around she's lost she represents those summer girls that Mayor Vaughn is talking about. Um, she represents, uh, in many ways, she could she represent as well as a possible future Chrissy Watkins? Uh, it, who is this character inside the Jaws universe? Is there a background to her? And that's, that's how amazing uh, that, that I think going forward, I know for me personally, my experience in not only researching, but following the story of the Lady of the Dunes has inspired me to look beyond in and expand out the Jaws universe and to look beyond on the very outer fringes. There, there can be different narratives crossing here and emerging as we move through and sift through all this information. It's a very, it, it's, it's one of the more fascinating aspects. So every time I watch Jaws, and the uh, 4th of July montage sequence comes up with a John Williams score, I always look over on the left side and I see there she is, the Lady of the Dunes. And that's in my mind. That reminds me that the Jaws universe is greater than we could possibly imagine, that there is more going on in this movie than we will ever understand. And to be able to get a glimpse of it is truly, truly a unique treat is it's truly a special moment uh, that this movie offers up and i hope that uh, after this episode you will have seen what i have seen that the uh, life and times of ruth marie terry should not be forgotten with the sands of time that going forward can jaws keep her memory alive and i think with episode 67 the lady of the dunes I think we can do just that. So going into the future, 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now, that someone will hear this episode and they will research and know that Ruth Marie Terry was a young woman who lived and died, that the death of Ruth Marie Terry is not lost and forgotten in time. Thank you very much for listening. This has been episode 67 of the Jaws Obsession, The Lady of the Dunes. Show me the way to go I'm tired, I want to go to bed So what do you think? Do you think that Ruth Marie Terry is featured in the movie Jaws? I would love to hear what you say. Love to hear your opinion on that if you go to our Telegram channel at the show notes and uh, see the side-by-side comparison of the images. And then you can write me here at jawsob.com, jawsob2025 at gmail.com. You can write me an email, or you can go to Book of Quint uh, over at instagram.com, at Book of Quint. The movie Jaws is copyrighted property of Universal Studios. Any references and sampling from the movie Jaws in this episode is intended to fall within sections 107 of the Copyright Act, The copyrighted materials are fairly used for the purposes of criticism, comment, reporting, teaching, and research. The materials used here are protected by the fair use guidelines of Section 107 of the Copyright Act, all rights reserved to the copyright owners. we got to definitely extend a special thanks to Joe Hill, horror author, son of Stephen King, for triggering this entire Jaws connection that um, it was great that we were able to get his voice and uh, onto the show with these news clips. Wonderful to see all the different articles. And remember, I'm going to have those posted over at the show notes. So remember to go to JawsOB.com and follow follow the links. You can listen to this broadcast and we could use some five-star reviews on some of the platforms over there, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. 
as always, it was great having you here. And thanks for listening. Until next week, farewell and adieu, and show me the way to go home. <laughs>